Hey y'all, God bless you all. Today I would just like to read us some scripture. Uh, we are going to be reading from Ephesians 4 today. But before we uh, get into the scripture, let me just pray for us real quick. Oh Lord God, oh Lord God, you are so worthy. Oh, you are so holy. You reign above all other gods. You are the one true living God. Oh, I thank you, God, for your Holy Spirit, which dwells inside of each one of us. I thank you, God, for the church body. I thank you, God, for each individual part of the body. I thank you that we are not all the same, but you have called each of us to um, our own unique purpose for you, our own unique calling. God, I pray today that for anyone who does not know what their God-given purpose is, what their God-given calling is, what their gifts and talents are, I pray for anyone who does not know that, that you would release that information to them today, Lord, in the name of Jesus, that today would be the day that they would know. God, I pray that you would anoint my vessel now, that you would help me to deliver this message with truth and with grace. We just welcome you into this moment, Holy Spirit. We know you're already here, but I just want to say you're welcome. Jesus, thank you. Thank you for dying on the cross in our place. Thank you for being the perfect sacrifice for doing what we could not do for ourselves. And thank you that I know you are coming back soon for a prepared bride. Oh, what a glorious day that'll be. We love you and we pray that you speak to us through the reading of your word. I know, God, that your word, it is alive. It is truly alive. So would you speak to us today? We are coming with open ears, open eyes, and a humble heart, and we are just ready to receive. In Jesus' name, amen. So we are going to be reading from Ephesians 4. I'm not sure how far we will go. We will just see where the Spirit leads. So, I'm going to be reading out of the Holman Christian Standard Version, just because that's the Bible I have in front of me. Um, so, all right, let's just get to it. So, it's, uh, Therefore, I, the prisoner of the Lord, urge you. First, let me give you a little backstory. So, this is Ephesians. It is written to the church in Ephesus. And it is written by Paul. Therefore, I, a prisoner of the Lord, urge you to walk worthy of the calling that you have received. With all humility, that doesn't mean false humility. With all humility, with gentleness, with patience, accepting one another in love. Another translation says tolerating one another in love. Diligently keeping the unity of the spirit with the peace that binds us. So what is it that binds us? It's the peace, the peace that we can only get from Jesus. Verse four, there is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to one hope at your calling. So let's go back to one body. The church is the body. We are considered the body with Jesus Christ as the head. One spirit. We know that's the Holy Spirit, the spirit of the living God. Just as we were called to one hope. What is our hope? Our hope is to Jesus. There's, there's no other hope. So we were called to one hope at your calling. One Lord one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is above all and through all and in all. Verse 7, now grace was given to each one of us 
according to the measure of the Messiah's gift. For it says, when he, meaning Jesus, when he ascended on high, he led captivity captive, or he took prisoners into captivity, and he gave gifts to people. So we're going to see here in just a moment that everybody has their own unique gift. We are all a different part of the body. Someone may be an arm, someone else may be a finger, you may be a leg, you may be the pinky toe, but every part of the body is needed for the body to be able to function properly. So if it wasn't for that arm or for that pinky toe, then the body wouldn't be in proper function, in proper operation. So verse 9, but what does he ascended mean except that he first descended to the lower parts of the earth? The one who descended is also the one who ascended far above the heavens, that he might, he might fulfill all things. Now, this is just um, something I believe what I'm fixing to say next. So I'm not saying that this, this, I just thought this was interesting. If you look, it says far above all the heavens. It's plural. So that shows that there are multiple levels of heaven which we know because we see that other places in scripture. So I think that this is another example of there being multiple levels of heaven. So verse 11, and he personally gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors, some teachers. Why did he do this? Verse 12 says, for the training of the saints in the work of ministry, to build up the body of Christ until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of God's Son, growing into a mature man or woman with a stature measured by Christ's fullness. So let's back up just a little bit. So let's go back up to where it talks about he gave, he called some to be apostles, some. Uh, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors, and some teachers. So today we see a lot of pastors, we see a lot of evangelists, and we see a lot of teachers. But in a lot of churches, especially in America, we don't see apostles and prophets as much. Now, at my church, we do. Um, not apostles, but prophets. But I want to say something. So if evangelists, pastors, and teachers, if they never ceased, then why do some claim that prophets and apostles are not for today? I mean, seriously, how does one justify biblically that the first two have ended? And if you can justify that biblically, please, I, I really ask you to leave a comment and provide me with some scripture that says that those two are not for today because nowhere in scripture can I find that. Um, and also, sorry, I wrote some notes here. So also, is it not interesting that the two that many American Christian religions deem um, that are not for today, apostles and prophets, is it not interesting that those are the two who hear or communicate God's rhema and logos, but mostly rhema word, most frequently? So what I mean by that is apostles and prophets, they hear from God very clearly. They communicate God's word. They are like God's spokesperson. So I just thought it was interesting that the two that a lot of churches are trying to say, nope, we don't need that, not for today. Those are the two that hear from God the most. Without apostles and prophets, who's communicating God's word? Not that teachers and evangelists and pastors can't hear from God. We can all hear from God. But the job of a prophet and the job of an apostle 
are more, it's more about hearing and communicating God's word. So let's go um, to verse 12. It says, so he, he gave personally, he gave some to be all these different things. So why? We see it's for the training of the saints in the work of ministry to build up the body of Christ. Verse 13, until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of God's son, do you think that we have all, all, reached unity in that area it keeps going and it says growing into a mature man with a stature measured by Christ's fullness so do you think that we have attained those three things no I don't think so verse let's see verse 14 all right it says then so then once we have attained those things we will no longer be little children tossed by the waves and blown around by every wind of teaching so deceive deception blown around by every wind of teaching by human cunning with cleverness in the techniques of deceit but speaking the truth in love. It's important to always speak the truth in love. I'm sorry, my children continue to keep coming in here. I'm trying to respond in love. So, um, verse 15, but speaking the truth in love. And first, let me say there is only one truth, and that truth is Jesus Christ. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. There is no other truth but the truth that you find in Scripture. Any other truth, it's it's false news. It's it's a lie. It's it's not the truth. So, um, but speaking the truth in love, let us grow in every way into Him, which is Jesus. So let us grow in every way into Jesus, who is the head. Remember how we talked about He's the head of the body. From Him, the whole body fitted and knitted together. So, in unity by every supporting ligament promotes the growth of the body for the building up of itself in love by the proper working of each individual part so what this is saying is we need every part of the body for the body to function properly so what happens uh when we don't have um Sorry, I wrote my notes so tiny. <laughs> so what happens when we don't have or we don't accept every one of these gifts, every part of the body? We must all do our part. Every part of the body is needed. So just want to read a little part of this commentary that's down at the bottom of the Bible. It says, five groups of gifted people are listed. Apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. Apostles and prophets are foundational for the church's work. The term apostle primarily refers to people sent with a divine mission or task. They also serve as spokesmen for God, bringing new revelation and understanding to the church. Prophets reveal God's will to believers for the present, so forthtelling and predicting the future foretelling. All apostles are prophets, but not all prophets are apostles. So evangelists are gifted to spread the gospel and to plant churches. Evangelists proclaim the good news in word and deed and instructive instructs others in evangelism. Pastors and teachers share similar responsibilities. Pastors provide oversight, comfort, and guidance as the church's shepherds. Teachers instruct and help apply God's revelation to the life of the church. Teachers are considered with passing on the church's revealed teachings rather than bringing new inspirational insights like the prophet's. And that's what I meant when I said rhema word and logos word. When I rhema word, in case you don't know, that's like, um, help me Jesus, like a fresh word. 
because God still speaks today, even if you are watching this and you go to a church that is completely dead, there's no power of the Holy Ghost, and maybe this is the first time you've ever heard that God does still speak, speak today. I'm here to tell you that he really does, and he speaks through his people. He speaks through his prophets. He speaks through his apostles. He also speaks through his teachers, pastors, and he speaks through his evangelists. He can speak through anybody that will be a willing, yielded, submitted, faith-filled vessel. So let's just keep on reading. Uh, verse 17 says, Therefore, I say this, and I testify in the Lord. You should no longer walk as the Gentiles walk in the futility of their thoughts or the darkening of their mind, I believe another translation says. So we are called, as we see in another place in scripture, we are called to take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. Verse 18, um, for they have darkened in, they, I'm sorry, they are darkened in their understanding and they are excluded from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them and because of the hardness of their hearts. They became callous and they gave themselves over to promiscuity for the practice of every kind of impurity with a desire for more and more. So that's like greediness, never being satisfied. Only Jesus can satisfy. If we look to anything else to fill us or satisfy us, we are going to continue to want more and more and more and more because it'll never be enough. That desire that's inside of us, that, that deep embedded longing to be filled, that is meant for God. That's why he put it in us. We are meant to long for God. We were created to want to be in constant communion with him. Verse 20, but that is not how you learned about the Messiah, assuming that you have heard about him and you were taught by him because the truth is in Jesus. Verse 22 says, you took off your old, or I'm sorry, you took off your former way of life, the old self that is corrupted by deceitful desires, and you are being renewed in the spirit of your minds. And you put on the new self, the one created according to God's likeness in righteousness and purity of the truth. Verse 25, since you put away lying, speak the truth, each one of you to his neighbor because we are members of one another. Like I said, we are all a member. We are all members of a one body with Christ being the head. And if the body is not in unity, then it's not going to really flow too great. You get what I'm saying? So verse 26 says, be angry, but do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger and do not give the devil a foothold or an opportunity. So when we let anger or bitterness or jealousy or many, many other things bull up inside of us, take place in our mind, when we allow that to happen, that gives the enemy a foothold. That's an open door for him to come in and wreak havoc in our lives. Unforgiveness is also another one. Those things are not of God and they do us no good whatsoever. So we have to shut those doors, shut the door of anger, shut the door of rage, shut the door of bitterness and unforgiveness. We need to renounce those things and repent of them so the door can be shut and so the devil can be kicked out of our lives in Jesus' name. Uh, verse 28, the thief must no longer steal. Instead, he must do honest work with his own hands so that he has something to share with anyone who is in need. No foul language is to come from your mouth, but only what is good for the building up of someone in need, so that it gives grace to those who hear it. And do not grieve God's Holy Spirit. You were sealed with him for the day of redemption. Did you know that we can grieve the Holy Spirit? The Bible tells us that the Holy Spirit is a person, and he has feelings, he has emotions, and he can be grieved or quenched. And that's definitely not something that we want to do. Verse 31, 
all bitterness, anger, wrath, shouting, and slander must be removed from you, along with all malice. And be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving one another, just as God also forgave you in Christ Jesus. Guys, if Jesus can forgive the men who were currently killing him on the cross, then surely we can find it in us to forgive whoever it is that has wronged us. I know that some of you have probably been through some very, very terrible, terrible things that caused you lots of trauma and lots of pain. I, as well, have been through some terrible things. But I had to find it in me to forgive my offenders because if not, I could not truly be free. Forgiveness is not so much about the other person as it is about you. If you are feeling really, really bound in life, it could be unforgiveness. And God can help walk you through that. If you are struggling with forgiving somebody, take it to God and say, look, God, like this person really hurt me. They really did me wrong. What they did was not right, but I don't want to hold on to this heavy yoke, this heavy weight of forgiveness, unforgiveness anymore. So Jesus, would you, would you show me, Holy Spirit, would you walk me through how to forgive so-and-so? Would you show me how to walk in unforgiveness? And if you ask God, I'm certain that he would do it. So I'm just going to read a little bit of chapter five because it is connected to chapter four. So we're going to read chapter five up until verse five, and then we'll stop. Therefore, be imitators of God, be imitators of God as dearly loved children and walk in love as the Messiah also loved us and gave himself for us, a sacrificial and fragrant offering to God. But sexual immorality and any impurity or any greed should not even be heard of among you as is proper for the saints. Coarse and foolish talking or crude joking are not suitable, but rather give thanks. For, for know and recognize this, every sexual, immoral, impure, or greedy person who is an adulterer with an eye does not have an inheritance in the kingdom of the Messiah and of God. So we're going to stop there because I know that was a lot. Listen, some of us have been lied to. We have really been lied to. And I don't think it was all intentional. I think some pastors have been deceived because their father, their grandfather, their great grandfather, they believed that all we need today is teachers, preachers, and evangelists. But I've just come to bring you the word of God today. And the word of God says different. The word of God says that we need apostles and prophets too. God is coming back soon. Jesus Christ is coming back soon. And he has so much that he wants to tell us so much wisdom that he wants to impart in us. And I hear him right now saying that there are so many of you who have spiritual gifts, so many of you that are called to be prophets and apostles, but you don't know that and you're not walking in that because you have been lied to. You have been deceived into believing that these things are not for today. God wants me to free you from that lie today and to tell you to step into your calling, to believe and receive. It is already inside of you. Whatever gifts God has given you, they are already inside of you. We just have to learn how to tap into them and then operate in them. And we do that based off faith. The Bible tells us without faith, it is impossible to please God. So if you're not sure what your calling is, you know you're not led to be a teacher, you know you're not led to be an evangelist. It's not really your thing. You know you're not led to be a pastor. Maybe you're supposed to be a prophet. Or heck, maybe you're even an apostle. The apostles didn't die. I mean, the, the apostolic age did not end when the apostles in the Bible died. Acts 2 ain't through. 
The book of Acts does not say the end at the end of it. God intended for his church to continue on in these gifts. So will you do that? Will you be a biblical Christian? Will you walk in your God-given gifts and talents? Will you be the oddball? Will you be the one who stands out? Will you take that narrow path? God bless you. I pray this message has encouraged you and equipped you. Jesus loves you and he has more for you. Whatever you're currently doing in your life, God has more for you. He has a deeper level of glory that he wants to unleash on you. He has a higher calling for you. He has more tasks for you. He has more people for you to go out and minister to. We all have a purpose. We all are a part of this body. And there's not one part of the body that God won't use if we will just yield ourselves to him. So God bless you.